Good morning, everyone.
I know there's a birthday. Mr. Gill, Mr. Gill, you have a birthday, I heard. Can you guys say happy birthday to Mr. Gill? Happy birthday to you. 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 Happy birthday, Gil. I think he's 25. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go back into some worship.
praise the Lord at all times. At all times, we'll praise your name. Amen. Ushers, would you come forward, please? You guys, please have a seat. safely to your house and it's just such an honor to worship you and bless you and we just thank you for all that you do and we just ask that you will accept these tithings and offerings and that you will bless them and they will just glorify your kingdom and we just ask this in your precious name amen, amen. Gently rest upon my heart. 
Luke 18, 1 through 8 says, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous said. Now, will not God bring justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and he will delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith. Will he find faith on the earth? Amen. Thanks for that, Jamie. And am I on? I'm not sounding very on. I cut and cut that. Okay, can we take it now? Children, you're dismissed for Children's Church. And have a great time. I know you will. You know, I was, uh, I, you know, being in the ministry, you become aware of, of stories, things that are going on out there that others of you may not have access to. And I heard about these two guys that uh, um, that they were, they always had one common argument in their life. And they couldn't decide whether Jesus or whether God was white or whether God was black. And, and so they argued about this theological thing all their life. Is, is God black? Is God white? Would you believe it? That both of those guys died on the exact same day. And when they went before, see, I get access to these things. You might not have heard about them. But <laughs> anyway, I'd like to hear it again. Anyway, so they, they died. They went to heaven. They went before Peter and they said, you know, just before we go in through the gate here, could you settle it? Because everything on that side is going to be different. But on this side of the gate, can you settle that question? Is God white or is God black? And, and Peter kind of giggled to himself a little bit. About that time, uh, uh, Jesus walked up and he said, buenos dias. <laughs> You know, we all have preconceived notions about what we think God is and, and what we think that God should be. You know what I have found out is that there's a lot of things that God just doesn't care about. And he doesn't want you to care about. And a lot of people spend their time wondering whether dinosaurs, I don't know. Did Adam have a belly button? I don't know that. I just, I mean, there's so many of these things that I can't give you answers to. And maybe God didn't want us to have the answers to. But we make preconceived conclusions about the things that we have no idea about. But I can tell you what, what God wants you to pay attention to is the word. The whole, which is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God, right? Amen. So let's open up with prayer and thank the Lord for his word. Father, I thank you for what you've given us today. I thank you. Uh, I'm really deeply thankful, Lord, for the impact of this word, not just on my life, not on just my wife's life, on my daughter's life, on their children's life. But Lord, I thank you that it is on all of each and every life that we have here today. Father, so as we express our interest in your word today, Lord, may it stick like glue. May it be applied to us diligently in every walk of our life. And we all said amen in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I can remember um, that, that there was a time when I first came here years ago, and you could hardly see the cloud. You know the cloud that we talk about that goes along the mountain. It just, it just kind of that, that dirty cloud that follows up along there. And then it got worse as years went by. Uh, it wasn't very long ago, maybe a decade, decade and a half ago, uh, that Colorado made a real concerted effort in kind to try to do something about the pollution. But there is pollution, and, and we have to deal with that. And I can remember times in my life when distinctly I could see pollution making changes in the world. For example, when I was a little boy, my dad used to take uh, me and my brothers out and we would fish because we lived in, in the DC area and we would fish on the Potomac River and we'd pull out some wonderful bass. It was just not a, a contest. You're gonna get bass if you go fish in this one area. I remember also going there years later and they shut the Potomac down because there wasn't anything but, but the, the, the pollution had gotten so bad that the only thing that you could get out of there was carp and, and uh, catfish and you didn't want to eat either one of those. So uh, it was that bad. 
Now, it's come a long way. They've worked and they've tried to fix the Potomac River and, and they've tried to, to take care of that. But pollution invades the air that we breathe, the water that we live or that we drink sometimes. And I can remember even in Japan, uh, years later when I was in Japan, um, that the, the, uh, the pollution was so bad there that a policeman would not be allowed outside to be able to do patrol for longer than a half hour without going back in and getting uh, oxygen for his lungs. It was that bad, and, and that was years ago, 40 some odd years ago. Um, so, so it can be that bad. I can remember in the 90s here, once again, pollution was so bad in, in the Philippines that uh, when I came back, it took me nearly two weeks for me to cough up all of the pollution that was in that area. And in our scripture today, the one that Jamie just read, what we find out is that Jesus talks about the landscape of the world as having that very thing, pollution. It's a landscape of death. It has a smell of rottenness. As a matter of fact, if you're uh, turned there in your Bibles, we're chapter 18 in Luke, but the very last verse in verse uh, chapter 17, verse 37, kind of deals with a little bit of that. And let's read it real quick and look at the end of that and let's see if what he's saying stands up to the truth of the uh, story that Jamie just read to us. Because he spent some time uh, talking to the disciples about what the end times are going to be like and how bad the pollution will be in the last days. And you know what they say? Uh, they say, Lord, where is this going to be? Because as bad as Jerusalem is, it ain't that bad. Uh, so, so where is this polluted place that you're talking about? And this is what he says, because no matter how Jerusalem uh, was bad for them, it wasn't as bad as Jesus was talking about. So what does he say? Jesus says this. He said to them that where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. And so he's talking about the vultures gathering about this thing that he calls death. And, it, and it's clear, I, I'd say that it's clear that you and I live in a world that is contaminated by death and is bringing about a smelly way to live. And, and yet, church, we, even though we live in one of the most beautiful places in the United States, one of the very most beautiful places, it's still polluted where we live, and, and, uh, and we can live in a very polluted world, which leads Jesus to this conversation about talking about a woman to make an astounding principle that I want to leave you with today. And I think that, that with this premise, or excuse me, Jesus will set the premise for us right up front. And if we get this, as you go in from chapter 17 into chapter 18, understand that even though that's a chapter differentiation, what he's trying to do is saying that there's a connection between the two. And so it rolls into chapter 18, and Jesus says to them in verse 1, he says, men ought always, or they ought at all times, men now ought at all times to pray and not lose heart. In other words, when the, uh, when the, the air is stale, and it will be, and polluted air is exactly that, it's stale. It doesn't have, it's oxygen deprivated, you might say. So when the air is stale, you have to rise up to where the clear air, air is. Understand what that would be like. Uh, and oh, by the way, he says that's why men ought always to pray. Praying, uh, in other words, uh, rise up above where the air is good. And so he said, really, prayer ought to be just like breathing. It ought to be the most natural thing that you do. And the only time that you should be conscious of not breathing, in other words, not praying, is when there is no air to be able to breathe. So you rise up above it. You could ask uh, Glenn, you could ask Eli. Matt, my goodness, are you wearing that one today? Is that... Is that the, the five or four? Uh, you are. Uh, and I think it was in 2013, so it's been a number of years now. Uh, some of the guys in the church, we decided what we would do is, is climb five, four, uh, 14,000 footers in, in just a couple of months. Five and four months. The five and four, that's the five and four. See him for t-shirt sales later. Um, <laughs> but uh, so and what we did is we found out, you know what? The, the first uh, 13,750 feet, problem. I can handle that. It's the last 250 to 500 feet that'll kill you every single time. So one step can be as consciously difficult as if you had just walked a mile. It is so difficult to do because there's just 
oxygen, oxygen deprivation. And so what he's saying is that when you become, when you get to where there is no air, when it becomes polluted, you've got to do something about that. And so all of this leads Jesus to be able to, it leads him into the parable that he's talking about. And, uh, and so when you, when we look at this story, probably a story that many of you have heard all your life, but if we look at it through a different lens today, I think that if you get what the parable is saying, it will change your life, literally. It can change your life if you grasp it. Now let's take a look at it in verse 1. The eight, chapter 18, verse 1. Now he was telling them a parable to show them at all times how to pray and not lose heart. And a saying that in a certain city, we're told that there's a certain city, doesn't say which one it is, but it says in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and he did not respect man. In other words, he doesn't care what God thinks, he doesn't care what man thinks, what he cares about is what the law says, because he's a judge, right? And by the way, isn't that what you want out of a judge? You want, you want your judge to go by what the law says. And so, uh, so it tells about a judge, but we also know that in this story, there's a widow in this story. And she's most likely been married. We know that because she's a widow now, right? We don't know much about her, but we know that, that he must have passed away. Uh, he must have died because now she's a widow. And as Jesus tells the story, he picks the weakest scenario that he can find. Because in Bible times, the widow and the orphans were the weakest link in, in all of familial society. And, and so it's the lowest of the low in many ways. Let me explain it to you this way. The woman had a number of issues going against her based on uh, biblical history. Uh, the woman, first of all, there was no legal protection for women in, at that day. There was for the man. There might have even been for your, your cattle. But can you believe that there was a time when there was no legal protection for women? And, and praise God, it's different today. But they did not view women the same way at this time as we know that God uh, created them to be. And, and so, so not only um, was that the norm of the culture, but she had no husband. And because she had no husband, she had no one to stick up for her. No one to fight for her rights. So girlfriend here has to stand on her own. And so that's the first thing. Second thing is, women are postured, or, or I should say widows are postured in the Bible as being poor. So she's got no money to draw on. She doesn't have finances that she can go into. And the obvious reason, of course, is she has the provider of her home has left her destitute. And, and, and maybe she's the primary caregiver for children. We don't know all of these stories, but girlfriend's on her own. And she's got to stick up for herself. And not only that, but because there is nobody else, she has nobody to plead her case. So she's got to take care of her legal issue all by herself. There's nobody to stand up for her, nobody to take care of her. She's got to do this thing by herself. And so she's out there by, her, uh, by herself on her own, and she's just trying to make it. And we're not told what really went wrong in her life, but something went terribly wrong. It has to be because, uh, and maybe it was that, that she had an issue with money. Uh, her husband died, didn't leave her any. Maybe it had to do with her husband's estate. We're really not sure what happened here, but what we do know is that something's wrong. Something's going upside down. And even though we don't have the specifics, this woman in this point in her life needs legal intervention and it needs to happen right now. Not in a month, not in six months. It needs to happen right now. And so she needs the law to work for her. She needs to be able to have something mitigated on her behalf for her situation that she's facing. And not only legally, but the legal ramifications would affect her probably physically, emotionally, and, and, and spiritually. Any other way that you can explain it, it is that deeply important. So you've got a oh, widow. She's in this city. She goes to the judge, and, and she says to the judge, and by the way, continually, over and over and over again, she says, give me legal protection from my opponents. I dare say somebody's coming trying to collect a bill. I dare say somebody, the, the bills just keep on rolling on. Anybody relate to that? Uh, anybody ever at a place where you, you say, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how I'm going to uh, pay for this bill. But this woman wanted some legal protection that was afforded her under the law in Israel at that particular time. So look what happens in verse 4 here. Let's pick this up. 4 and verse 5. Uh, for a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, 
<laughs> oh boy. She could have said, even though this woman nags me, uh, no, you know, no guy's saying amen on that. I don't know why, but, but I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Now, I want to tell you something. No matter how this man looks at this, her point of view is, I'm starving to death. I've got somebody that's going to take the little bit that I do have and steal it from me. Take it from me. I need legal protection. Would you not be continually nagging or talking to the judge yourself? I, I would encourage you to. I go with you. In fact, so don't fault this woman for what she's doing. But the fact of it is, uh, she needs somebody to be able to operate on her behalf. And so now the judge's point of view is, this woman's going to wear me out, isn't she? I mean, I can't, I can't get any time to myself without this woman calling my home on the telephone or whatever they used at the time to be able to tell me, I need your help, judge. I need your help. And, and this woman's wearing me out, and I'm going to give her legal protection. Not because I like her, not because I favor her, and not because I care about her, not because I need her vote in November, but because she will not give me a break if I don't give her the legal protection that she needs to have. And so the judge makes a decision to operate legally on her behalf to take her case. Now, what the woman had wasn't the judge on her side, um, but what she did have was the law on her side. And some of you, your wheels are turning and you're trying to figure out, how, how are you going to turn this? What was Jesus talking about? What does this do to relate to me? We'll talk about that. But even if the judge didn't care about the woman, even if he didn't care about her particular case, she kept on bringing up, but the law says, but the law says, Your Honor, don't you know what the law says? And so she kept on bringing the legal piece up, so judge has to deal with the legal side of it. He has to. Even if he doesn't want that case, he's got to deal with it because she is bringing it up over and over again because the judge is legally obligated to the law. He's got to do something about that. So, let me explain what I'm trying to say here today because this is important and it relates to your life and my life today. What I'm trying to tell you is what Jesus is trying to tell you and what our story is trying to explain today is that God, who cares so deeply for his people, when his righteous are concerned about what the law says about their lives, what you need to know is that God will always be obligated to his word, which is the law. In other words, God is tethered, no matter how you want to look at it, God is tethered to the law. God is tethered to his word. Now, God cannot do what the unjust judge was trying to do and ignore it. God can't do that because God's, by God's nature, by his very nature, is righteousness, and the judge was not righteous. In fact, in, your, your, uh, in the side notes of your Bible, probably calls him the unrighteous judge, Right? But what, so God cannot treat you like that, but you bring up the law and God has to obey his law. He has set it forth in his word that if you bring his word and set it before him and let the judge know what his word says, he is tethered to it and he has to obey what his word says. Now watch this woman now, watch this now. Because the woman asks for perfection protection because she knows that, that, that the law will afford her grace, will afford her help in time of need. But let me put it to what, uh, another way. If she didn't know what the law says, then she couldn't have gone to the judge and gotten help at all. And I think that's the biggest lesson here, is that she wouldn't have been able to call upon the law because she wouldn't have known what the law applied in her broken situation. So she had a, a couple of things that I want you to know. She had to know the law. She had to know the application of the law. And she had to call upon the law. So she had to know what it said. She had to know how it applied. And she had to do something about it. She had to call upon it. So it was her knowledge of the law that allowed her to be able to get the help that she got. And there was righteous laws in the, in, in the Bible. As a matter of fact, I could probably tell you what they are. The righteous law would be is that you watch after widows and orphans. Matter of fact, you might remember this. It was so common that even in the time of Jesus, that they go past the time of Jesus into the apostles. And when uh, the apostle Paul went back to Jerusalem to uh, show what it was like for Gentiles to get saved, because before that it was just the Jews would be saved. 
But what Paul was showing in the church of Jerusalem was, is that even Gentiles, that'd be you and me, we can get saved. It's whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. But he had to prove that to the original disciples. So when he went there, they saw Titus, they saw Timothy, and they were amazed. My goodness, isn't God full of grace that he can lead anybody into repentance and anybody should be able to get saved? That was, that was a little side note to what I'm trying to tell you because what they asked Paul was this. They said, are you still taking care of widows and orphans? See, that was important. That was in the law of Moses, that you had to do that. And Paul said, yeah, never stop doing it. Always do that. It's one of the first things that you do. And we at our church try to do the exact same thing to this day. So what does this lady do? She goes to the authorized person that, that needs to get uh, this uh, to render the law on her behalf, and that's the judge. And you can read the judge's point of view, and the judge pretty much thinks this woman is a nag. What he's missing is the fact that she is in need, but what he doesn't miss is she's calling upon the law to get exactly what she needs. Okay, because she knows what's written in the book. Now, if you hold your finger here, I want you to go back five chapters, and we're going to go back to chapter 13, and I'm going to give you a great example of what this looks like. And if you uh, have been calculating how much we've been in the book of Luke since late November, you're right, we spent a lot of time in there. And the early part uh, of that was talking about the birth of Jesus. But we've spent the last couple of weeks in this particular uh, book here. But look at this, chapter 11. And in this chapter, it's a Sabbath, time for Sabbath. It is a Saturday, which falls under the Ten Commandments. So once again, we're talking about the law here and the application of the law. But let's see how this, uh, this uh, turns out here. Verse 11. There was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double. In other words, she, she was crippled over. She couldn't stand up. And, and so she couldn't straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your sickness. And he heals her on the Sabbath. Instantly heals her, but it's on Sabbath. We'll get to that in a second, what that means. He laid hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had, if you can get this, healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there's six days in which work could be done. So come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. So they're saying, Jesus, you're out of order for trying to give this woman the single greatest thing outside of her relationship with, with God. You gave her the single greatest thing that she's ever had in her life, and you should have done it on a different day. You should have waited, maybe next week, maybe the month after that. Maybe never, really, but, but Jesus calls him on this. And Jesus in verse 15 says this, but the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites. Now, answered him, but all who were listening, he says, you hypocrites. If you believe him, if you go with him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, watch this now, and this woman, not just any woman, but this woman, here it is, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, not just any woman, but this daughter of Abraham. Let me tell you, it's not just this woman, but let me tell you about her relationship. Because this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on Sabbath day? That's not hard for us, because shouldn't the greatest thing of your life happen on, on the Lord's day, right? It should happen on any, can happen on any day. But to say it shouldn't happen on the Sabbath. And so he calls them on this. Now watch this now because he says, you old hypocrites. You let an old cow loose just so it could get some water. But you won't help this woman who has been sick for 18 long years. Not just a little flu bug. But she was so crippled over she couldn't even stand up. And, and if you can imagine that if you tied your neck to your ankles, and you tied your ankles together, and you tried to walk. Maybe that gives you an idea of just how painful it was for this woman to walk. But she still wanted to be in church. She still wanted to be in the presence of God. And so he says, I came to release an older woman who has also been tied up for 18 years, and you want to get in my grill about bringing her healing? Really? I mean, you're not talking about releasing a donkey. You don't care about that. Really? 
Is this where you want to go? Because this woman has a relationship issue, and we took care of it. See, blank, point blank tells them that this woman, from the time of her birth or after however long it was, he said, I released her because she's a daughter of Abraham. I released her because of relationship. Now, now, now watch this for a second, because this might be confusing to you. It certainly was to the, to the Pharisees. Because they're talking about the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law says that you can't work on Sabbath. Okay, let's say that's the case. You can't work on, on Sabbath. But Abraham preceded Moses. And, and because all of the covenantal promises that God gave to Abraham, he gave to Moses. But that precedes Moses. So that still went on to this day. See, a lot of people mistake this. Did you know that there is not a Mosaic Covenant? There's Mosaic Law. Did you know that, that, know that there's not Abrahamic law, there's Abrahamic covenant. A covenant is given to you by God so that as long as you last or as long as you live under that covenant, the benefits of that covenant are extended to you to this day. And Jesus points that out to them. Because the covenant here is with her because she's a daughter of Abraham. And so, by the way, Moses was already also covered under that covenant too. He had the Abrahamic covenant, lived under that. And so here it is, uh, when especially the problem comes from a spiritual source, Jesus is saying, you take care of that and you take care of it. Now, I like what it says when introducing John the Baptist, when he was talking about sin, I think it's in Matthew chapter 3. There's a saying that this kind of slipped right in there you could miss, but it says, now is the axe laid to the root of the tree. In other words, when sin comes up, you take care of it. When an issue that is caused by sin comes up, you take care of it. And that's what's going on here. That's the issue at hand. She's a child of covenant. So it says that Satan had so messed her up spiritually that it affected her physically that she had to walk over. And it wasn't just because, bent over. And she, it wasn't just because of her age. And it wasn't just because of the calcification of her spinal cord. It was, and we see it here, it was because a devil had so messed up her spiritual life, her physical life was affected. The devil had so intervened in her life that her physical problem was tied to a spiritual dilemma. But she had something that the priest didn't understand. You know what she had? She had a covenant to God. It was tied to her through the Abrahamic covenant. She, was, she had a legal relationship that was tied to her because she's a daughter of Abraham. And because of that, uh, that, that legal relationship, it overrode the Mosaic law that says you can't do this kind of thing on Sabbath. It overrode that. Now, uh, let me give you an example. If you get, go out today and you drive uh, east here, you come to Glen Creighton and take a left, I think that, that once you take a left towards Frederick, that um, the, the city of Frederick, because you're in Frederick immediately as you turn there, I think the speed limit, if I'm not mistaken, is about 45. Now that's the law. And on the other side of it, it's probably 45, might be 35, 45, but, but that's not the, 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 the thing I'm trying to tell you about. There is another law that supersedes the 40, 35 to 45 law, and that is that when you get into the school area, there's a sign that says that if you go to that other speed limit and you go there during school hours, we're going to get you, we're going to give you a nice little special ticket that's going to allow you to give us a lot of money. And, and, and so that's a law that supersedes that law. Now let me tell you about another law that supersedes both of those laws. If there's a fire over at, at, um, at, at the rec center or in that neighborhood and a fire truck is right here and it gets a call, it's going to go through there and it doesn't care what the speed limit is and it doesn't care how many kids are, are right around there. They're going to go through and pity you if you're in the way. So you've got one law that supersedes supersedes another law that supersedes another law. What I'm trying to tell you is that if you don't know what the law is, you can get all mixed up by it. And, and it can bother you, it can harm you, and, but, but here's one that she has. She has a legal law. She has a legal relationship that overrides the Mosaic law that says she can't get healed on Sabbath. And, and, and so that's very important. And Jesus brings that to bear in her story here, that she has a legal relationship that needs to be paid attention to. And so if you don't know your legal relationship, then guess what? It, it, you can't call on it to be able to deliver you from your pro problematic situation. 
That's the whole story. That's what this is trying to tell you. And this woman has had a messy situation for 18 long years. Let me ask you something. We wonder why God hasn't come through yet. We wonder why God hasn't answered our problem situation when the fact that maybe what we haven't done is call on our legal answer for our particular problem. Maybe we haven't just appealed to our legal right. So when I ask you the question, why haven't we appealed to the legal right? You know what the issue might be? It might be that we don't know what the legal answer is. We don't know what God's word, God's word says about our situation. So we don't stand on it. And what we do is we expect that the judge is just going to take care of our problem. Even though he does, even though you haven't brought the problem to him, we think that the judge is just going to take care of it. And the fact is, Jesus is saying, if you will use the law right here, and you will take it to the judge, and you will show the judge what the law says, the judge will take care of it for you. See, what Jesus is trying to do is teach us how to pray. That's why he started this off by saying, Men ought always to pray. You ought to always be bringing these things before God. And if you do, guess what? He's going to take care of it. How many have a situation you want to take to God today? My hands up. I want to tell God what his word has to say about my situation. But here's what we do. A lot of times we, we, we may have a legal prayer, but we don't pray legally. Now, what did I just say? Um, we pray legally, and we have a legal prayer. I mean, it's, it's good for us to pray. Jesus said, y'all ought to pray all the time. Okay, all right, we pray. But it doesn't mean that we pray the kind of prayer that Jesus is saying we ought to pray. And we pray these, these kind of um, crazy-like prayers. We, we, we get generalities in the way that we pray. We say, Lord, bless my food. Oh, bless the service while you're here. Lord, would you bless the whole world? In Jesus' name, bless me, bless me, bless me. And, and we just kind of throw these general prayers out. And God is saying, Jesus is trying to tell you what you need to do is be more specific in your prayer. And if you would be, now tell God what his word has to say about you. For example, if I were going to pray right now and, and I had a health issue, I'd be saying, you know, Lord, it seems to me that I remember two and maybe three places right now, just off the top of my head, what your word says about my healing. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, and also uh, copies that over from Isaiah 53, 5, that you are wounded for my transgressions, you are bruised for my iniquities and chastisement of my peace was upon you, and with your stripes I am healed. Whoa, the Lord, I just want to remind you of what your word says. Will you heal me in my broken situation? We can have a lot of broken situations. It might be your health. It might be that, that your health is suffering because of a financial situation. And you bring that up before the Lord. And Lord, I, 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 I need to be healthy in all things. And you remind the Lord that he sent his word and he healed them of how many of their diseases? All their diseases. So I'm reminding the Lord of what his word says. It says, his, he, he will give you peace that passes all understanding and let it rule your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. I'm going to remind the Lord of that. Lord, I just thank you that I can get a peace from you in my broken situation, in my, in my dilapidated situation, Lord, would you bring me peace that lets me know that I can have peace, that you're going to get me through this no matter what. So Lord, what I'm doing is reminding you of your word and God likes it when you remind him of his word. It's not that he's forgotten about his word. He hasn't. But he wants you to remind him of it. And, and, and so what difference does that make? Look in verse 8. It says in verse 8, because what you're doing is you're talking to him about what he said, and you're reminding him about his promise to you. So let's look what he said. What difference would that make? And, and uh, let me get back to it and close my book. And it says, verse 8, it says, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. Well, somebody out here ought to say amen. amen. <laughs> he brings justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, look at what he says here. However, Jesus is saying, that's the judge, but let me remind you of who your judge is. He says, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? Faith in what? He said, faith in what this word says. Did you stand on this? Did you use this in your broken situation? In, in your broken situation could be a relationship issue. It could be a work issue. It could be a, a, a just a personal issue that you can't even talk about. But he said, did you take the word to bear on your broken situation? And, and, and so he said, will I find faith on this earth? 
Some of us have been waiting a whole lot longer than we needed to be waiting. And Jesus is telling you this. Some of us have been struggling a whole lot longer than we should have been struggling. And Jesus is telling you that. Why is it? Because really what he's getting down to is we tell God about a whole lot of stuff. But that doesn't mean that we tell him about the, what he needs to be hearing. And God wants you to tell him about his law. God wants you to take his law to bear and let his law come to bear on your situation. And God is committed. Remember we said this. First and foremost, not to your feelings, not to your circumstances, not to what grandma said, not to what mama said, not what Aunt Betsy said, not what you think. But he is first and foremost committed to what his word says about your situation. Mm. And so I love this next part because that's when the woman comes both verbally and publicly and she solidifies exactly what needs to happen. I love this lady. I, I just, I love her specifically for this because now she's telling the law what the law has to do according to what the law says. She's telling the, jaw, or the judge this is what's going to happen here, Judge. You're going, to, you're going to come to bear, and you're going to use the law on my behalf. You're going to do it, and, and I know you will, because you're concerned about your own opinion in the polls. You, you, you're concerned about yourself, and you will obey the law. I know you will. So now she's telling the judge what's going to happen, and she's decreeing what needs to be done. Oh, I, I love that. Because what does Mark 11, 24 say? Do you, do, do you, do you know that offhand? If any person, when you see that mountain in front of you, of you shall speak to that mountain and tell that mountain to be cast into the sea, it will have to do what you say because you did it according to his word. Mark 11, 23, 24, look it up for yourself. It's a great, you know, sometimes uh, people don't believe that these kind of things are in the Bible. Look in the Bible. See for yourself. If you will speak to this mountain, and you know what an impossibility is. An impossibility is anything, an impossible situation, a mountain in the Bible is an impossible situation that asks for you to climb over it simply because of who you are. I love impossibilities. It was impossible for, for us to be able to be in this building here. There's no way we could have been in this building. Over at that building over there, the amount of money we had each week came into this amount. At the end of the month, it was just a little bit over that. And, and it met every need that we had. The moment that we walked through the impossibility of coming over this building, what happened? I couldn't believe it. Offerings went up to what we needed. And Mike, as a chairman, was looking at this and said, you know, there's something really incredible happening here. I just noticed that what God is doing is meeting us at whatever we speak out that we need. He's waiting for us to put our faith on the line. And the moment we put our faith on the line, isn't that right, Mike? And, and when we put our faith on the line, you know where God met us? Exactly what we spoke out. Oh my goodness, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we dare ask or dare think. You don't think we quoted that verse? In Lord, according to the power that is in us. The power that's in us, that's what the scripture says. So Lord, according to the power that's within us, I think you're going to be able to put us over every single month. You know what? He's done exactly that. I mean, there's no way. You couldn't have put that on paper and explained to me how we could be in this building, but God worked it out. God worked it out. And, and, and praise God for them. The miracles that we've seen in your life. I remember yesterday in my quiet time, I was talking about this to the Lord, just mulling some of the things that we're going to talk about. And I said, oh, Lord, I just wonder what this day has. And, and I kind of knew what, the, what was in store because I knew that there was going to be a, a shower, not one that would clean me up, but, but a baby shower for one of our ladies that's getting ready to have a, a baby in about two weeks. A week and four days, but who's coming? Um, how many hours? <laughs> and minutes. She's hoping that it's shorter than that. Um, but but I knew that that was going to be happening. And I knew that normally on a Saturday, I'm going over my notes and I'm, I'm just kind of uh, just mulling and, and, and talking to the Lord about what he wants to say. But I said, Lord, it, you know, I just give this day to you. By the time I get a call from my daughter, a youngest daughter, who is also pregnant, and is due maybe a month after you, you're due, and she, she just goes, and this is a man's way of saying it. Men, you'll understand what I'm saying. Women, you'll send me a, a lot of mail this week trying to straighten me out on this issue. But she went, she went pregnant on me. And, and what that means to a man is, is uh, different than what it means to a woman. But she, her tire had blown out. I, mean, I can tell the whole story else. She won't get this. 
uh, because we all had to come to an understanding of exactly what was going on. So, so I was, uh, when I say she went pregnant on me, she, she was just very nice about it. She said, Dad, I had to put my tires on <laughs> and, and so that's what that means to me. Um, and, and anyway, so, so I said, yeah, I'll be right there. Where are you? She told me where she was. I drove straight out there, was with her, fixed the tire. She said, when I got there, she said, uh, she's calling. It's going to be, oh, Dad, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> what else was I going to do? <laughs> and, and, and so, and, but she said, you know, I'm going to tell you about something else that's going on here. As soon as it, I knew it was going flat, I pulled into this Conoco station. I started putting air in it, and the tire blew. It just blew while I was putting air in it. And there's a lady behind me. Don't look over there, but, but she's in that car behind me. She's homeless, and, and, and she thought something was terrible wrong. She didn't know if I blew up. Um, but, but so she came over to, to help me, and Dad, she, she's, she's not saved, and she needs to be saved. How do I witness to her? And I began to see something develop. Because you've seen, you've seen this with me before. I'm always looking for an opportunity to tell somebody about what the Word says, about what God says about them. And there is no, nothing that happens by accident. Do you, know, you all know that? You don't have accidental meetings when it comes to the things of God. And so, and so I said, well, I, you know, listen, the Bible says, and you should get used to saying that. What does the Bible say? That's, we're, we're still in the same lesson here. Right? What does God's word say about your situation? So the Bible says that when you get, Jesus said that when you come into a situation <clears throat> where you've got to give uh, your word about who God is, about who Jesus Christ is, when you come into that time, don't worry about what you're going to say, because the Holy Spirit will give you the words. That's what I told her. So I said, let's just see how it unfolds. And she looked at me like a cow at a blue gate, like, what are you talking about? And I said, no, just trust me on this. Let's just wait for this to develop and see what, what God wants to say to her. Because you don't know what her backstory is. We're in Boulder. I, mean, I have no idea. She's going to knife me if I tell her about the Lord. So let's see what the Lord has. Right? And so, um, did I say something wrong? Anybody here from Boulder? <laughs> Ushers, would you just kind of form a line up here? <laughs> Anyway, so I, I just said, let's see what happens. And, and then she comes over, and Jessica turns around and lets the Lord lead. And she said, this is my dad. He's a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't know if that's exactly how the Lord wanted to do this, Jessica. But, <laughs> but you know what she did? The woman said, you're not going to believe this, but I've been looking for a pastor. Okay, all right, here we go again. You've heard me tell these stories about how I just walk in and somebody says, I've been looking for a pastor. <laughs> okay, here I am. Um, and I would suggest that every one of you call yourself pastor something <laughs> and, and go out and soul win. It, it works great, and it did for me. Anyway, so I opened the door for I could talk, so I could talk to her, and, I, and come to find out she has been homeless and it wasn't her car, it was her boyfriend's car, who was at work, and, and it's not really her boyfriend, they don't like each other anymore, but she, he wants her to stay in the car with her, and I don't know what it is, but it's not a good situation. And, and she knew that. Interesting, and just to throw this little thing in here, her sister had been murdered some years back, her, her, she has a niece that's been calling her up over the last couple of weeks, and, and said, Aunt, would you come and stay with me? I need to find out who I belong to, and I need you to come and be with me. Had that on for 20 years. Been running from God for 20 years. Uh, all these things were going on. She was struggling because of the hold that this guy had on her. Are you seeing the connection here? A, a, a spiritual issue which has physical connotations. And she needed to be released from that. Along comes a blow-up, an entire terrible thing. And Je Jesse leans over to me and she says, I think this is going to be worth a blown tire. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it to yourself, Jess. Let's just see what the Lord's going to do. <laughs> you know, before it was all over. Okay, so we changed the tire, and the she had just got... How does something like this happen? She just got new tires put on two days ago, three days now. How does that happen? And Jesse knew that it was worth it to have a blown tire to lead somebody to the Lord. Come on now. I'm going to tell you, does God move? And so what we got a chance to do is to re really, this is the best way to say it. She, she had known and, and talked to God. She said, I ran away from God so many years ago. I blamed him for my broken down situation. But I talked to him now. I said, okay, well, let's really talk to him. And so we got to reaffirm her relationship in Jesus Christ. 
so that she can know who he is. And then told her this, and this is always a killer if you're talking to somebody. Um, it, it, it just breaks down the situation to where God lives. You know, I'm not here by accident. You know that, right? She just got new tires put on two days ago. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God led you here, didn't he? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but that sure does add up. And, and, and so we begin to look at that and realize that God was behind this whole thing. But it doesn't matter whether I see it. It doesn't even matter whether Jesse sees it. It matters whether she saw it. And I would never tell a person, you need to go back to Iowa. You need to do this. You need, you, I, I don't, you know, God will tell you. And that's usually the way that I would pray. But I can really tell that God was setting this situation up. you got a girl who needs you. And, and guess what? She's a church-going girl, too. And, and, and she told me that. She said, oh, yeah, she, she's an evangelical, one of those non-denominational Christians. And I said, oh, go back to her. Go back as quick as you can and, and work that out. And go back home. Well, so God interrupted my morning with all the great things that I had planned. Um, good things are always good, right? I mean, Y'all had something to do yesterday. It was important for you. But the most important thing that I needed to do is to walk according to God's word. Because God's word, the law, intervened on a woman's behalf that could change her whole direction and change her dilapidated situation from where it was to put her on God's plan for the future. Never let God's, let, never let your past determine your future. Never let the situations of what's going on in your life yesterday determine what God has in store for you tomorrow. So deeply important that we understand that. Okay, so, so what I want to do, and you must say to this mountain, decree, your, what, what's your decree? What do you want the mountain to do? Get out of your way? What, what's the big mountain in your life? Say to this mountain, decree your deliverance. And a couple of verses before that, doesn't it say, and all throughout the, the, the Gospels, doesn't it say, isn't it written? Jesus will say, is it not written? Is it not written? And, and sometimes he talks to the devil, and he, he said in the temptation, he said, it is written. So whether he's asking, is it not written? Doesn't the word say? Or whether you're telling the devil himself, this is what the word says. Or you're telling God, this is what your word says. And, and, and what you're looking at is a situation you can't get over. What you're looking at is a hump or a, 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 a bump in the road or a circumstance that you can't get around. What you're looking at is a problem that you can't solve. That's a mountain. What you do is you go back to the law. What you do is you go back to God's word. What does God's word say about this? And then what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to look at your opponent, you're supposed to look at your situation, and what you say to your situation is, I want to know what God has to say about my mountain. I want to know what God has to say about that bump in the road. I want to know what God has to say about my marriage. I want to know what God has to say about my finances. I want to know what God has to say about my bed up situation. I want to know. I want to know, because once I know that, guess what I'm going to do, Mr. Devil? I'm going to speak to my situation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to speak to my marriage. I'm going to speak up to my crippled up situation, and I'm going to speak to that, because in my broken down scenario, I want to know what God has to say about it. I want to apply it to my situation, and I want to see God be God, and will not God move quickly. Amen. Amen. Oh, give him a hand for Amen. Now let's look at what verse 8 says. Because he says, I tell you that he will bring around justice. He will bring about justice for them quickly. However, the big question hanging out there that Jesus wants to know about is, will he find faith on this earth? Will he find you applying the law? Are you applying what he said? Everything that he died for. He died for it so that you could use it. And verse 8 says, he will show up quickly. He will show up out of nowhere. He will give you, and he will make way where there is no way. Because that's who he is. Because you applied the word. But he's got to get you to function based on the revelation of the word of God. Not based on how you feel. Not based on what Aunt Betsy said. Not based on your emotions. Not based on the past. Not based on what happened yesterday. And, and especially not based on what you've been going through for the last 18 long years. Like that woman in our story. Not any of those things. Because if you're a daughter of Abraham, if you're a son of Abraham, if you're, if you're related to that covenant, which if you're a Bible-believing saint, if you believe in the Lord your God, can I tell you something? This covenant is for you. 
This covenant is something that you can abide by because then he can pick you up from a life that is bent over. He can pick you up with a situation that's been broken down and crippled for years. He can take that and it says quickly he'll take care of it. Oh, by the way, what's quickly mean? Quickly. Yeah, I, that's about as good as it gets right there. It means out of nowhere. It means it suddenly. It means whoosh, out of the air, out of the blue. And it happens quickly. You know, Isaiah uh, chapter 46 says, God will establish his purposes. And then uh, Job 22, 28, it says, decree what God is, get, uh, it, it, decree what it is that God is to do so God can quickly do it. So God can get it done. You want to speak to your situation, but when you do it, you speak to it in Jesus' name. When you do it, you speak to it with a law behind you because when you do that, God will answer you and answer you quickly. But what you cannot do, I told you what you can do, but let me tell you what you cannot do. Quit letting your situation speak to you. I almost hear, heard an amen on that you do not let your situation determine who you are. You do not let your past determine who you're supposed to be. Right? You let God tell you who you're supposed to be. Because God is not bound to what your situation tells you about the matter. Did you get that? God is not bound to be able to help you because your situation has been telling you what to do with your life. God is bound. He's not bound to how you feel. He's not bound to what somebody else said. He's not bound to what mama said, what dad said, what anybody else said. God is bound to his word and his word only. And he is sure enough not going to be bound to what the devil says about you. So why do we listen to that? He is bound to his word. And that's the only thing that God will commit himself to. Too, is to what he says. And so that's why somebody ought to be willing to pray, like Jesus said. That's why he said that you ought to be willing to pray now. You ought to be willing to call on him now. You ought to be willing to call on him night and day, day and night, 24 hours, 7. It ought to be the thing that's always on your mind. What does God have to say about my broken down situation? And some of you here today, can I speak to you just to your hearts very quickly before we close? I don't know what your situation is, but it may be that everybody here has a situation of one sort or another, or you've been praying for somebody else with a broken down situation. Appeal to God. Appeal to God with his word. If you can't find it, ask somebody else. If they don't know, go to the concordances, which is where you should have gone anyway. Or uh, one of the greatest concordances in the world right now, called the internet. <laughs> <Google>. <laughs> Put it there. What does God say? That one, one underneath there. Don't pick that. That says, "Are you feeling lucky?" Don't feel. Don't. Don't choose that one. But see, what does God have to say about your situation? I don't know whether I should take this job or not. What does God say about that? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't have something directly to say about that. But it might have a lot to say about having peace in a difficult situation. It might have something to say about when you're on troubled waters, putting your trust in God so that he can speak peace to the water around you. Oh, you know what? I had a job over here. You had a job over there. I really feel at peace about this job. I really feel at peace about this relationship. I really feel at peace about this prayer request. It might be that simple. But it might be that God wants to deal on something from you in the inside. Maybe a forgiveness issue. A brother told me a story yesterday, just real quickly. Um, and I, and I, I'm just kind of working through my introduction here, so uh, hopefully I'll be... No, I'm serious. <laughs> it's difficult, Mike, getting through the introduction. That's the tough part. If you can get through that, the rest is a breeze. Let's close in prayer. See, I told you. Um, just trying to teach you a few things, a few tricks here. Uh, but but a, a man told me a story yesterday. He said he went to another church, visited another church in Colorado, a, a very large church. And out of the blue, the man begins to tell a story. He said, you know, I was in a gym. And at that gym, there's only me and, and, and two other older women. And, and, uh, and we, were, um, we were there. We were doing our exercises. And, and you know, in gyms, it's all, they might have a little light music over the uh, intercom system. But most likely, a lot of people just put on their earplugs or their earphones, whatever. And they're listening to something uh, by themselves. But then these three teenagers, uh, teenage guys uh, that obviously are want to hook up and bulk up. And, and, uh, and they got their music blaring, and it really bothered him. And, and what it did to him is that he decided that he was going to get down right before they got down and started pressing uh, the weight, you know, on weights on the bench. 
he'd get down and he'd throw a couple extra barbells on there to just show them who's man here. This is Pastor talking. And he threw his neck out. <laughs> now, he said, he said, you know, he was telling me the story, and I said, so was he making the conclusion there that there was a spiritual issue there that was going on with, with him? And he said, no, it didn't have anything to do with what he was talking about. He was trying to tell us why he had pain in his neck, and he couldn't even get rid of the pain in the neck. And, and he said, but I could see through the lens of what he was talking about that there was a spiritual issue that needed to be taken care of that was affecting a physical issue. What some of your problems might be today is that you need to forgive somebody for years and you have. You know, let, let it sink, it's okay. You don't have to say amen, you might want to say oh me, I don't know. Um, but, but some of you might have situations that just need to be cleared up like that. And, and if those were cleared up, would they be standing in the way? Because if you've got the law on your side, God will answer and he will answer quickly and it will get done. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Lord. I don't want to conclude our moments together without offering anybody that may have walked in here a clear opportunity to give their life to Jesus Christ. A, a lot of folks can listen to a message like this, and just like the woman yesterday, you could say, you know, I, I, I've talked to God. I've talked to him a lot. And, and you know what? A lot of people talk to God. We're never sure which God they're even talking to, if you were where I was yesterday, it could be any number of, of gods. But, but we're talking about Jesus Christ who came and gave himself for you and died for you. So you can listen to a message like this and never have a personal relationship with the Christ that's at the center of this message. Let me explain it really, really simple for us. You and I were born sinners. And it would never be possible for you and I to be able to save ourselves. We, we're not capable of that. You cannot be good enough. You'll never be that good. So God came up with a plan to be able to provide salvation for us. And to be able to do that, what he did is he sent Jesus Christ to the cross to die on our behalf. And so he could be our substitute. Because it was your sin that nailed him to the cross. He didn't come for any other reason. He sure didn't die on the cross for the fun of it. Because he sure didn't need to do that. He was compelled because of his love for you. And his love for me. But God validated his purposes to us when he raised his son from the dead. And all you have to do to come to Jesus is when you come, you ask for the forgiveness of your sins. And for the gifts of eternal life. And he will give it to you. He'll give it to you freely. And he gives it to you with no, no, nothing expected back. Except for you to give him your life. So that he can give you his life. What a substitute. What a substitute. And he made provision for you through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All you got to do is accept the provision. That's all you and I have to do. And when you do that, you're born again. When I did that, I was born again. And you get to start the clock all over. And that's what I told this lady yesterday. The clock starts now. Uh, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Yeah, I know, but I, I know what God did. You don't know how low I've gone. Yeah, but I do know how low he went to get you, to save you, to make it so that you and I, no matter how low we were, could rise up and stand on high with him. I know that. And you can respond to that. You can respond to that kind of love by raising your hand right now and saying, I want that kind of love in my life. I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And if you've never accepted Him, if all you've done is just have a nice little simple uh, this and that for God, but you've never made Him your Savior, would you raise your hand if you'd like to accept Him today because that can get taken care of. I want Jesus as my Savior. I want Him to be my Lord. So you can start your life all over again. So that the clock can start right now. And you can respond just simply by raising your hand. I want to accept Him as my Savior. Pastor, I want to be a Christian. I want to be able to call on the judge for the issues that come up in my life. Is that you? It may be that, that what you've named the most 
is to know what the law says. And I'm hoping that this simple gospel message helped to do that today. Just to straighten out a few issues for you. That you can call upon the judge, you can use his word, and you can use the word to be able to declare what your situation will be. And by doing that, the judge will operate on your behalf. Maybe that's what you needed to do. And for the next couple of minutes as we're singing, and just before we close, what we're going to do is we're going to have an opportunity for you to come up to the altar. If you want to just ask God, God, I, I need somebody to pray with me, to pray for this broken situation, for this crippled up situation. It's been bent over for many, many years, and I can't seem to get it straight. But Lord, will you speak life into it? And I'd like to pray with you. We'll have people up here. We'll have uh, our elders be up here, and we can pray with you regarding that. And no, we want to, because there's no reason for you to walk out of this place with a broken, bent over, crippled situation that's been hurting, that's been, that's been holding you back, that's been telling you, whispering in your ear, things will never be the same anymore. They'll never be the same. It's too late. It's never too late. I saw that so graphically when I got to speak with this woman yesterday. And she said it was too late. And I said, really? Because God just sent you somebody, interrupted my day to come here and tell you it's never too late. And God is telling you the exact same thing this morning. Be delivered. And there's nothing about that. There's nothing that the Mosaic Law or, or, or the, the Tacoma Police or, or the Frederick Police or anybody else can do about it. God's law is God's law, and it has always superseded anything else in your life. Is always superseded by the covenant that you have with God. That if you serve me, if you love me, you've got covenant with me, and I will come and fight on your behalf. I will do it. And I'll do it today. So as we close with this last song, if you need prayer for that, won't you come up? And don't be afraid to. This altar should be the most friendly thing that you've ever known in your life. But don't leave with an issue like that without us praying with you. In Jesus' name.
to tell others or pray for others in Jesus' name. And, and this is what I pray over you. I speak over you. Because we said we could speak it out, right? So I'm going to speak this over you. That what God will give you for your life is an allowance to see Him being bigger than you've ever seen Him before. I just speak it over you in Jesus' name. And what I also speak over you is, is that you will begin to realize that you're the reason that people will be in eternity with you in heaven. That you're the reason that these things don't happen by accident. That God can cause all sorts of things to happen in your life that you would have never thought could happen before. But don't 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 be quiet about your faith. And when these things happen, go up to might be at the counter at the grocery store. Might be at a laundromat if you ever go to one of those anymore. It, it, it might be a church. <laughs> might find somebody who needs Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh my. You know, there's a lot of lost people in churches today. Did you know that? They go to church every Sunday. And they're as good as can be, but that doesn't mean that they ever gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Wherever you go, you go. I pray for you and speak this over you that you will become the Kono's greatest evangelist. And that there will be a, 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 a relational um, miracle that happens between you and God and the people that you meet. In Jesus' name, I speak that over you. God richly bless you. We'll see you next week or third week. Amen.